Welcome to the Manga and Libraries webinar series. Tonight's topic, Manga and Libraries Teaching with Manga. Experts will discuss the benefits of including manga in the curriculum, manga titles and lessons, addressing challenges, resources for teaching support, and more. These webinars are sponsored by the New York City School Librarians Association and the American Library Association's Graphic Novels and Comics Roundtable. You can visit mangaandlibraries.com to watch past webinars and to get information about upcoming webinars. I'm Jillian Rudis, the school librarian for a sixth through 12th grade public school in New York City and the Japanese culture and manga special collections librarian for the New York City Department of Education. Hello, I'm Dustin Hensley. I am a school librarian in Elizabethan, Tennessee. And this coming fall semester, I'll be teaching a uh, elective class in manga. Hello, everybody. I'm Eric Kellenborn. I am currently the department chair of fine arts at Oakland Community High School on just south of Chicago. I've been teaching with comics and graphic novels in my classroom for about, man, forever now, like 13 years. And I have started a English comics course at one school. And now I have an art comics course at the school I currently teach at. And I teach that course as well. Hi, I'm Eric Koh. Um, I'm the Chief of Operations at Udon Entertainment. We publish manga, we publish uh, art books uh, based on video games and anime, uh, and we do comics, you know, like Street Fighter and Darkstalkers and Mega Man and stuff like that. Also, uh, in the last couple of years, uh, I also co-founded Manga Classics, which uh, the aim is to use the manga medium to get the younger generation to actually read classic literature stories. Hi, my name is Matt Slater. Um, I'm currently the education program manager at Pop Culture Classroom, uh, which is a nonprofit in Denver, Colorado, all about increasing literacy and love of learning and celebrating diversity through the tools of popular culture and the power of self-expression. So uh, we create teaching guides for graphic novels, we create history-based comics, and then we do a lot of workshops here in the Denver area uh, all around how to create comics, how to create board games, uh, world building for sci-fi and fantasy, uh, and many things like that. Hi, uh, I'm Shavetta Miller. I am a former language arts teacher who used comics in the classroom at the high school level. Um, and now I support teachers with professional development. Um, I'm the author of Hacking Graphic Novels, a resource uh, to support teachers using comics in the classroom, um, and also the director of curriculum at Reading with Pictures, a national nonprofit uh, promoting the use of comics in the classroom. Hello, everyone. I was the web services librarian for Hostos Community College at the City University of New York. And in the fall, the reason why I believe that position is because I'm studying a PhD at the University of Columbia High School, where I will be doing research on intersections between disability, tech, and manga. It's nice to meet you all today. Uh, you're all pretty amazing. <laughs> so thank you for joining the conversation today. And I'm going to dive right in with the first question. So feel free to answer whenever you're you're ready. So why do you think manga has yet to make it into the mainstream, the standard curriculum? Is it misconceptions, challenges, lack of access? Tell me your thoughts. I get I could address that question first. Um, as somebody who's relatively new to like diving into manga, right? I mean, I've, I've always known it's there and I know my students were interested and I've read a book here and there my kind of diving into it has only been recently, but I have been dealing with comics and graphic novels in a classroom for a long time. And one of the things I've noticed is that our students for sure are into the graphic novel medium. They're into comics. So I think when we talk about comics in the classroom, a lot of teachers immediately, they're going towards American comics, right? They think Batman, they think Spider-Man, they think Superman, and they don't know a lot about manga and anime because that's something that like maybe their kids watch and read. They don't necessarily dive into that. There are some, there are some, but for the most part, most teachers don't read a lot of comics. And I think going from, as an American, from comics in, American comics into manga is yet another step. You don't just start as, generally, you don't just start as an American comics reader into manga if you're older, 
Like if you're getting into the medium at 30, 40 years old, it's not something you jump into. So there is a barrier from a lot of teachers and administrations and librarians maybe of, I don't really know what this comic graphic novel thing is about. And now you're putting another step into it where it's like, oh yeah, well, there's these things, but there's also this vast a majority uh, literature out there of this Japanese art form that you may not know about, but all of your students are interested in doing it. So I think it's, it's a fear of, and you read it backwards. So it's like, oh man, like I just started reading comics though. Now you're, now you're telling me I got to read this thing backwards. So there is, there is a big fear of teachers and, and school officials kind of going that step further. Um, and, and I think that's one of the when we talk about the mainstream, right? It's in the mainstream. You go to Barnes and Noble, that manga section is literally seven to 10 times bigger than the normal graphic novel section. Like there is no doubt. There's more One Piece than there is Batman, right? I mean, it's 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 100% true. So it's in the mainstream. It's just not in our mainstream schools yet because of, I think, those small barriers that, that are there. Eric, I wanna follow, oh, sorry. Uh... Is it okay? Okay, because my, my the prompt that I wrote down um, is exactly that, the relationship between comics and manga. So I should clarify, I'm talking from higher education, so after high school. Um, yeah, so there's a very interesting divide in how manga is taught and not taught in the university classroom compared to North American comics and graphic novels. When teaching Japanese in North American colleges, um, often the textbook actually has manga in it. And I will call out one textbook in particular, which is Tobira, which is an intermediate Japanese language textbook used across the United States and Canada. And it has manga, it has a chapter in Japanese novel culture. So even if a student has no interest in manga, they have to learn about it for that class. Now, what if we go to our history class at that same university? So Professor Melania at Stanford teaches an awesome history class called Global History Through Graphic Novels, The Modern Age. It's awesome. And there's some manga, but it's mostly comics because again, there is this access challenge. So for me, what I view the access challenge is like this access to lessons plans and manga volumes. Like, can you imagine having to buy all these volumes for your classroom if your library doesn't have it? That's really challenging. So I think for librarians, we're already building collections for researchers. We're already building collections for Japanese language literacy. So we really need to start building collections for the classroom. And then we can, you know, spread manga to all the departments and have it leave this East Asian cultures and languages department because there's so much manga and so many different genres. And it's like, should be in the history classroom, should be in the literature classroom. Why isn't it there? I want it there. I, I think kind of going off of both of these, it's a, a lack of available curriculum as well, right? Um, you know, it is a struggle for teachers to sometimes take something that, that they love, uh, advocate for it to administrators, right? And then be able to create the curriculum to teach off of, but also again, to show the administrators that this is rigorous work, right? I think we're getting there with comics, with Western comics, there's more available curriculum that teachers can go to without having to do the extra work of really like diving deep to create everything that goes with it. Uh, but for manga, in my experience, that's uh, much harder to find. Um, so on top of, uh, you know, if you have a teacher that is less familiar with the, the, the format, asking them to then learn about it and then create curriculum for it, that's just a whole extra mile. So they may know that yes, their kids are into manga and it's gonna benefit their students, but kind of the element of doing that research themselves and then creating the, the content around it um, is an obstacle that if we can uh, take that obstacle away from instructors, I think that it will start to become more, of, uh, uh, more accepted with the curriculum. I agree. I was going to say something similar, Matt, that um, so I support curriculum adoptions in my district and also used to work for a large uh, literacy publisher whose curriculum was probably the majority of schools in states across the country. Um, and I support uh, schools K-12. And so the younger you get, the more you see that schools do rely on adopted curricula um, and to have that sort of guaranteed viable access to high quality materials and aligned instruction across a district. So even if a teacher, you know, happens to have this specialty area and interest in a genre or medium or topic or set of standards, um, it, it's often the system doesn't support that teacher to then go rogue, so to speak, and create something, you know, and if they do, there's a long process involved in terms of proposing a elective to the school board and getting that 
approved and adopted um, and then training up colleagues to do the same. So, yeah, I mean, there's a lot of systems obstacles there, you know, that don't even have to do with accessibility to the actual text themselves. Um, but yeah, that that access to curriculum support. Um, and then, you know, we know, I think a lot of us were teachers or are teachers and th that system of the school calendar, you know, where you're teaching bell to bell, you're teaching eight to four, um, you know, where, where are teachers going to gain that familiarity with genres and media that they don't already have fluency with or a natural inclination towards, you know, we have to acknowledge that teachers still go into this field because they really enjoy a subject or a skill um, and they want to share that love with young people. Um, so, you know, for it to really make its way into daily classrooms and experiences, uh, they need to have, you know, high quality, yeah, instructional supports accessible with, the, with training provided to make that actually easy to implement. I, you know, I, I think every, what everybody said before echoes all my experience with, you know, work, working with the teachers, you know, on, on building uh, our manga classics books, uh, getting them into classrooms and stuff. But I also want to share my story uh, of like, how come I, I started doing manga classics is because uh, there is this taboo. Uh, there is this taboo from our last generation uh, on, our, on our last last generation these like comic books and mangas especially like you know are, are something that is not literature are not something that's reading these are just like funny books and like my mom when I was doing Street Fighter when I was doing you know all, all these other Japanese mangas and, and stuff my mom's always been bugging me is like you know can you do something better because my mom's actually a high school principal back in Hong Kong her major is English literature and English and, and Western history so she is a very academic person. She she loves literature. She loves these classic books and stuff. And when my mom's nagging me all these years, like, can you do something better for the kids? Why are you doing these books? There's pe it's like people beating up people and stuff, you know. But but those are like the entertainment stuff that the kids like. But then I, I've been thinking about it over and over again. Then I have my daughter. Um, you know, my daughter right now is uh, thirteen. Uh, she loves to read. When she was a kid, she loves to read, and and she loves to read anything and everything, especially like you know comics and stuff. Because I have tons of comics at home, so I I come up with these ideas like what if we we get what the kids like nowadays, but then apply it to something fun, much like when back in the days we have classic illustrations, uh, you know the classic illustrated uh, comics that that shows off the classic literature stories that we got us intrigued. And then, you know, we will go and look for the, uh, you know, the actual, um, you know, classic literature books to read when we grow older. So I, I looked at the, you know, the, the trend. I look at everything that I do. I look at what the kids like. And then manga is a good medium uh, to do this. Uh, despite the difference, there's a difference. There's a lot of people going like, oh, manga is just comics. But actually, no, there's a big difference between manga and comics. American comics are normally something like, you know, 32 pages uh, worth of of content maximum they do sometimes do graphic novel but then most of those are about like 100 150 pages while manga started off at 150 pages um, we sometimes go all out and some of our books are like 400 pages to make sure that we can actually convey the story properly you know get all the details done properly the storytelling format to the way the art is done it's very different than a comic book. So manga, it's arguably more engaging and it can express the emotions of the characters, the actions of the character better. Um, so that's something that I myself has been always pushing, you know, manga as a medium uh, for, for reading, for getting kids to read. And I believe that is something that we have to keep telling, you know, the, the world that this is a good medium to do. One, one last thing I would like to say that I think it's really important for like those of us out there that that love manga or have fell in love with a manga to get those titles into the hands of other teachers and librarians who maybe not have read a lot of, of those titles right while I'm thinking about it like if you whoever's watching this you have a favorite manga give it to somebody who's never read manga and let them fall in love with it and then maybe that'll open the door to them to read more manga as well. It's no. actually, it's actually, sorry, I just want to add this little thing, Dustin, sorry. It's just a very interesting thing because I started off this manga classics program to use manga to get kids to read classic literature. But after six years, 
more than half of the feedback are a lot of reluctant manga readers who are adults who was like, I don't know about manga. I'm worried about manga, but I saw Pride and Prejudice, which is my, you know, like, like my most favorite book. So I need to give it a try. And it's like, oh my God, you know, manga with Pride and Prejudice is actually great. And now I know how to read manga with no pressure. And then I understand it more. And then they would try other mangas now. And I, I, I never thought that there would be this angle, you know, to try to get, use classic literature to get people to read manga. But I guess this is a good, uh, an interesting outcome too. And Dustin. Yeah, I'll, I'll be the Southern gentleman and go last. Um, so I think that an essential piece of why it's not coming into the mainstream curriculum is that there's so much unfamiliarity with the, um, with manga that teachers uh, intrinsically have to be the experts on a topic to be able to teach it or to be feel comfortable in teaching it. And they know so little about it that they're afraid to dip in that, um, that more on the traditional teaching route that um, it's hard to learn alongside your students or from your students. Um, so that is something they're very fearful of. And I actually asked um, three of our English teachers uh, this question and the responses I got back were one, the number one answer was uh, we just don't know it. And two, there's not enough time to teach it because of all these other things we have to teach from the state. Uh, and three, uh, they were concerned about the lack of text per page. Um, that one caught me by surprise, but I, I guess I see where they're coming from. Um, I think we can have that discussion a little bit later on, but that was another thing that two of them brought up independently was the lack of um, actual words per page. Well, that's actually a great transition into our next question, which is, oh, I moved the question. Um, we know that manga has its own unique format and style, but similar to comics and graphic novels, comics, oh, sorry, manga can support a variety of literacy skills as well as support the social emotional development of readers. So this question comes in two parts. One, how can educators and librarians use manga to support the literacy skills of readers? Um. If I may start, um, when we started working on our books, we specifically work with teachers and librarians, especially teachers, to try to figure out how to best adapt, uh, you know, a classic literature story into into manga, into graphic novel format. Um, I we have been udon by itself. We have been a, a creative studio working, you know, on comics and manga artwork for different publishers and stuff. Um, so in terms of, you know, like being an editor, how to do a storytelling and stuff, you know, we are very capable of doing that. But what I found out is to adapt, uh, you know, like a, a literature, classic literature story into the format of graphic novel is very different than trying to draw an, an issue of X-Men that comes out of nowhere. Uh, you know, like these especially for what we are doing, we are trying to create a faithful adaptation of the original story. So there is a lot of give and take, but then we try to at least put in all the, the dialogues, we put in all the, all the text um, and all the context and don't truncate it too much. And that is why we choose the manga format as well. Um, however, you know, I, I, we saw a lot of arguments with teachers and and you know these older generation of educators going like it's different reading reading something with pictures is different from reading something everything as you know as text but i i do not agree because i think what graphic novels does in general it, it, you know would help the readers uh actually visualize the story better which which will help them manifest their you know the imagination better um, especially nowadays, you know, there was, there was a lot of people, like when I was a kid, when I go and, and do the English class, you know, in, in high school here, uh, which when I just first came from Hong Kong, you know, it's a very difficult task. I, I remember I had to go to Blockbuster and rent out like, you know, Macbeth or, or you know, like Midsummer Night's Dream and watch it in order to understand the book. Um, so now what I want to achieve with, with our mangas are, instead of like going out there to do a video, you you actually read the book and our Shakespeare books actually feature it un, unaltered, uncensored, uncut full text of the Shakespeare script. 
because for the Shakespeare books, we can actually do so because Shakespeare itself, you know, the Shakespeare books itself is actually just a script. So basically what you're reading is basically, you're, you, it's, it's basically like you are watching the play. But I would argue that reading a graphic novel or a manga of Shakespeare is actually more advantageous than going to see a play or watching a, you know, watching a, a video or like a movie of it. Because when you watch a play or watch a, a movie, normally you just like go and go and go because it continuously run. And, and for the kids who sometimes don't understand something, they won't pause and go back and look at it again. They won't do that. It was like, okay, it's done. And I kind of figure out what it is. I kind of think what it is and again move on. But reading a book, you can do it at your own pace. If there's something that you don't understand, you go flip back and forth. It's like, wait, what is this again? Oh, oh, this is this line is about that thing. Oh, this is about that. And then they can pause and do it at their own pace. So as a learning experience, as a learning curve, I would argue that reading uh, you know, a, a manga or a, a comic adaptation of something, it's better than watching a movie adaptation or, you know, or going, going out to a play. I think that is one part of the things that I, I think, you know, uh, graphic novel and manga as a educational medium is very important. I mean, I think there are so many kind of branches to this answer right here. Uh, the, the student interest is the easy one, right? If you get them something that they're interested in, especially for our struggling readers, they're going to be more uh, invested in trying to struggle through to comprehend what's going on. But just like with graphic novels and comics, with our manga, you have those scaffolds. And I think manga actually really presents itself well because um, a lot of readers get left behind right they kind of go through this school process of maybe they don't read in third grade they don't meet the third grade reading benchmark but they get promoted to fourth grade and then they're being taught fourth grade standards and they fall further behind because they didn't meet the third grade standards and then possibly they fall further behind and what happens is we see all these students in middle school and high school they're still on elementary school reading levels right so the problem is you have to find a book that fits their interest level but is also accessible to them and able that they are able to decode the words and comprehend what is happening in the story, right? And so manga gives us that opportunity to give them something that meets their interest level. And then they also have the images as a scaffold to be able to comprehend and decode the words and comprehend what is happening in the text, right? They've got all the facial emotions that help them understand what is happening between the characters and the character development, especially for our students that might be um, differently abled learning wise, right? Um, so, I mean, there's just so many different uh, ways that it supports, you know, um, Eric was just saying that it, it is better to uh, be reading a book than watching a film, which is absolutely true because you can self-monitor when you are reading a book. You can say, oh, I didn't quite get that. You can go back and read at your own speed, right? Um, so uh, I think it's great for all readers, of course, but especially for those readers that are struggling or behind on their reading level, it meets that sweet spot of interest and accessibility. Um, I want to add to what Matt is saying, um, because we in in reality, our teachers have a range of learners. We know that there's different needs. Um, you may have striving readers in need of intervention um, in a classroom with students who are accelerating beyond grade level. Uh, most likely you will have that. And um, and so what I like about manga is that it, it's a perfect example of that kind of text or media that meets the low floor, high ceiling uh, criteria for, for good instructional materials in the classroom to be able to include access to rigorous, challenging, stimulating, interesting, DOK level four um, type thinking, cognitively demanding, mind blowing work um, with accessible um, uh, roads in for all of your students. And so, um, you know, when you do some research on uh, manga instruction, you'll see two different um, camps. You'll see people saying, um, oh, it's it's more cognitively demanding than text only um, resources. And then you'll see the other side saying it's actually less cognitively demanding. So it's a good entry point for struggling readers, you know, when it actually it's, it's both. Um, so you know, the cognitive load is decreased, like Matt was saying, um, 
partly because of that consistent systematic style um, that's really expected and predictable. Of course, there's variation, but more so than in um, Western comics and graphic novels where you picture like how a character is drawn, no two readers are gonna picture the same kind of iconic form, whereas in manga, you very likely will. You'll, you'll have um, features that are consistent across thousands of, of manga texts. Um, and so that kind of reliable style is very accessible. Um, and so, you know, it frees up the cognitive space to be able to engage with plot because so much is predicted and, and known. Um, but in other ways, the cognitive load is definitely increased. Um, like, I think the, the question that the comment from the teacher that Dustin shared earlier about the concern of very few words and more visuals um, that's so specific to manga is, um, but research also shows that the less dominant the verbal form is in any text, the more complex the other modalities can actually become. So then you actually have much more sophistication in your visuals in manga because they are doing so much more of the work. Um, and then that work they're doing, right, is, is work related to storytelling and communicating information and ideas. And these are all part of the standards in all of our subject areas. So how does this different modality of visual, something that's important to math and science and literature and communication, especially in our 21st century world, um, how sophisticated can we be with communicating not just stories, but information and ideas and nuances and subtleties? Um, and so studying that through, through manga, I mean, what else would you use other than manga? <laughs> it's doing that in the most sophisticated way in terms of what is accessible to us now, like like Eric mentioned at Barnes and Noble, you know, no one's going to struggle with finding a lot of variety um, of manga to really teach that complex analysis of, of visual work. So low floor, high ceiling, perfect combination for the classroom. I also think that manga has the really unique, like I can't think of any other medium that's like this where it, for so many manga, there is a pretty much one-to-one -one analogous uh, anime that goes with it, right? Where volume, episode one of the anime is going to be frame for frame the same as the manga, right? And so that's a way that you can build interest with your students too, is okay, we're gonna watch the first episode either with English subtitles or with English dubs, wherever your, your students are at. And you can do a couple different things there. You can build interest, right? You can have them read it with the subtitles, see how much they comprehended, and then be able to go back to the manga to, um, you know, kind of compare, okay, this is what I got when I was reading the tech, the English text at full speed. Now that I can slow down, what am I understanding or what I, am I getting here that I was missing before? And then also that gives you the opportunity to watch the first episode, set your students up for success by giving them a, a baseline of, these are the characters, these are the settings, this is kind of the context of what's going on. And then that way they can use that as a jumping off point as they, you know, reread that in the manga and then continue on for, you know, the next few volumes or issues or whatever it is that you have them reading. I'm, I'm glad you mentioned that, Matt. Um, another great example of how the video form or the anime form that supplement that complements the the manga um, is a way to uh, support striving readers in the classroom. But it again is another way to raise that ceiling as well, because now you're bringing in another modality, another medium. You know, it's not going to be the same. It's just not going to be. So, like, what are the what are the differences in viewing this, you know, as a viewer versus reading it tactilely? Um, what are the differences in it? Like really higher order questions that um, can be engaged with by all students while also being a support um, as well. All right, thank you so much. Lots of good information there. I'm just like shaking my head like, yes, yes. <laughs> But the other part of that question is not only can uh, manga help to support literacy skills, but manga can help to support the social emotional development of its readers. So how is it that librarians and educators can support SEL uh, by exposing their readers to manga? I'd like to discuss how it 
librarians can do this in particular. So for first year experienced librarians wishing to support the social and social development of their readers, I have a series to recommend. So let's consider our mindset and our ability to cope with challenges. The transition from high school to college is a difficult one. That's part of why we have first year experienced librarians, right? So in Blank Canvas, my so-called artist journey, we meet creator Akiko Higashimura. And she's, this is before she becomes famous for Princess Jellyfist. Um, and I really don't like doing spoilers, I'm sorry, but I'm gonna do a spoiler, this one. Um, she does go get into her college, her art school, and she works so hard for it for so long and so many chapters, and she freezes, she can't paint. And that is something that a lot of our students also experience. And what makes this work really good for SEL is that it doesn't say, and one day she wakes up and can do art and everything. No, 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 this one is too good for that. So she learns to manage and she does graduate from Kanazawa College of Art, but like the readers can learn from our protagonists, their ability to cope is something that can be practiced and honed. Um, it's your mindset, self-efficacy, self-worth. These are things that have a great impact on your work-life balance, your relationship with your mentors. But Akiko, this is specifically her art class teacher from high school and life transitions. And because I know a lot of you guys have worked in K-12, K I want to recommend another one for high school, which is one of my favorite series. Um, she you know can't say her name. She's also doing the transition from middle school to high school. And um, what really pushes this work, makes it stand out from like canvas is there's a part where she has a fight with like her first close friend. It's really hard. But again, we see these interpersonal skills develop. It doesn't just end, it isn't just a perfect ending because that is not our reality. And um, my other comment on this series that I always say is it's one of volume. So this is something our students can pace themselves with even if they're really put off when they look at one piece with all those vibes, it's okay. She no can't say it's one. I'll also comment on the SEL component of it too, because I think one of the things manga has really helped me do with my students is just make better connections, right? So I do, I do run, co-run uh, an anime sci-fi club at my school. So because of that, and it's a pretty big club too, and mostly we talk about the sci-fi part is really small and the anime manga section of it is like really big. The kids are all in uh, manga and anime and they wanna talk about it. And I have some of those students in my classrooms as well. And I read recommendations that they give me all the time, right? So I have a couple students that will just come into my office every morning and bring me a new book. And I read every single book they bring me. So, and then the next day, I might not have it done overnight, but I'll have it done within a couple of days and I give it back to them. And if I don't like it, I'll tell them why. And we can have honest conversations about the book and what I thought about it. But what they're doing is they're giving me stuff that I know them and their friends are into. And a lot of it does have... Victoria was talking about like the, the themes that those ideas and those themes, they contain those themes and those ideas that are really important to those students. So that if I have a student in my classroom, this has happened a number of times this year that I want to make a connection with and I see them drawing, uh, drawing manga. And, and, and I now know that that student probably reads manga, watches anime. And if I want to make a connection with them, which I did with this student who I know is a sophomore and she's thinking about art school, so I walked up to her and I was like, hey, have you read this book, Blue Period? And she was like, no, I haven't read this book. And I said, here, here's volume one, check it out, read it if you like it. Let me know, I think you're really gonna dig it. And then I got volume two when you're, when you're done with it. She read it overnight, loved it. And after I gave her that book, she opened up to me like she had never done for the, the, the entire semester so far. So I kind of use those books as um, an entryway to have conversations with students. And if I know a student is struggling, I'll try to find a manga that I think that they can relate to. You know, I just started reading, I just finished, by the way, Boys Run the Riot, which is fantastic. Oh my God, loved that series. It's only four volumes. I, I just ate, I couldn't, I had a hard time getting volume two, but once I got it, I just like finished it all in one night. And that's one that I am going to keep on my classroom shelf and use and utilize for conversations all the time. Loved, loved, loved that book. So th there's, you know, and I know, Teachers are looking for ways to kind of incorporate SEL into the whole into the whole curriculum and into their whole classroom. But I think almost more important is this idea of this one-on-one -on -one connections with students that really need it. And how are you building those, those social and emotional connection, connections to those students? And I have manga all over my classroom. I have comics posters all over my wall. So there's no hiding who I am and what I'm into as well. And I just think that I want to lean into this importance of using that medium as a way to connect to kids on a personal level. And it's absolutely fantastic. I just want to add to that, Eric, because 
I like that you have the conversations with kids because they come into my library, they read manga all the time. And it's just like this uh, turnstile or whatever the expression is of just kids coming in and out all day. But the SEL really comes from those moments with the conversations, allowing students to reflect, to share what they're learning, to share the connections that they're making, because that's where the growth is going to come in. If they just like read it on their own, they're not necessarily going to be able to really self-reflect um, and become self-aware and all of those things. So thank you for having the conversations. Yeah, on that um, SEL note, um, I, I think a lot of people like assume manga is like all action and fighting and such but even in those type of series there are SEL skills that can be learned and taught and brought out um i had a uh, student a few years ago that uh was often in trouble for fighting and i introduced him to full metal alchemist and talking about um like fighting for the right reasons and fighting to protect instead of fighting to like, do harm and such and um like he went from a discipline, discipline referral per week to none to his last two years of high school uh, that, that's like such a huge success story that he, it, it, Full Metal Alchemist, is, I think, is the greatest uh, piece of literature ever created. That, that's just me. But um, still, yes, tattoo. Um, so that, I just saw something in chat. I got really excited. Wait, wait, um, you have to say Dustin, because otherwise people are going to be like, he's just growling over a tattoo. Uh, tattoos. Um, <laughs> is it an Ouroboros? Um, Eric Callenborn just said in the chat that he has a tattoo. Um, so full my tattoo. So that's, that's very exciting. Um, so sorry, everyone that's watching. Uh, you just got to hear the um, primal growl of a uh, Appalachian man getting excited about anime tattoos. Um, but there are also uh, like the people that think that there's just action. There are so many great series that are so much more than action. It's just pieces of life. So in my area, uh, we have very little racial diversity. Uh, we are 96% white. Um, so one of the series that's been really popular in my library recently is uh, Satoko and Nada. Um, so in this series, uh, there are two college roommates who meet up in America. Uh, one is from Saudi Arabia and one is from Japan. And it's about them learning each other while also learning American culture. So that's been a really good one for like helping introduce a lot of my students who are white to here's what culture is like in other places and how they would adapt to culture here to whenever we have students for, that are going to school here that are trying to uh, adapt to um, our Appalachian monoculture. Uh, this is the experiences that they're going through and trying to understand what's happening. I was going to mention something like that, Dustin, about the exposure to other cultures. Um, as I'm thinking through media, you know, I'm thinking of other mainstream media that is coming directly from another culture that is widely consumed by our anybody in, in our culture. And I'm thinking uh, Japanese manga and anime and Japanese video games, I think are probably the most common ones, right? And so being able to have the discussions of, well, that tradition looks different, how they eat dinner looks different, how will they go about this looks different and talking about, okay, so what do you think about that? And, and having building that kind of empathy of other cultures and um, just people that um, come from different environments and do things differently and how we respond to those things. Thank you, everybody. Uh, so next question is, have you ever taught a manga class or hosted a manga book club? If so, what was your approach? What manga or lessons did you teach? Or how might the content and the resources that you create support the teaching of manga? That's so two parts for the two, two types of experts we have tonight. Um, I, I would love to jump in here. So uh, a couple summers ago, Pop Culture Classroom, Classroom worked with Viz Media to create a few reading guides um, for a summer reading club that they were doing um, this was summer 2020. So height of COVID, they were doing a summer reading club that was virtual. Um, they actually had a um, an influencer doing YouTube videos uh, to try and support other people to uh, facilitate these manga clubs. And so we created uh, reading guides. Um, they're kind of uh, uh, 
more club oriented of our graphic novel teaching guides. So Pop Culture Classroom creates teaching guides for graphic novels that are common core lines. They have project ideas, discussion questions. And these are kind of the light versions of that to support like it is, you know, a summer club and things like that. So they do have um, some discussion questions. They're not common core lines, but it's a great jumping off point for teachers. They have some project activities in there. Um, and we have them for the first volumes of Naruto and My Hero Academia and Comey Can't Communicate. Um, RWBY and Uzumaki. Um, so those are all free on Pop Culture Classroom's website, www.popcultureclassroom.org. Um, so you can go and kind of get a jumping off point of how you might want to teach some of these uh, uh, different manga. So to connect with Matt, because we actually worked with a Pop Culture Classroom this semester, I teach a 12th grade elective called Japanese Visual Storytelling. The reason why I called it that is because we were afraid of what manga would look like on the senior transcript. Manga class, and then it would just have like all the misconceptions. So we're like, Japanese visual storytelling. I don't know. That's how we got approved. So, but what I did was I focused on the social emotional learning uh, within the stories. So the critical lens that we used was how does the mangaka um, show the character's social emotional development and how does the manga support the reader's social emotional development? And so students read Boys Run the Riot, Comey Can't Communicate, and B Stars, and then they got to pick a fourth manga of their own and connect it to SEO. But what they actually did was they worked with Matt to create reading guides in the form, Matt, you haven't seen this yet, in the, in the format of the Pop Culture Classroom Reading Guides. So these are available with the overview of the book. All right, they're so beautiful. And then the key themes, we talked about themes, the key characters, and then they worked on developing um, discussion questions, but the discussion questions connect to just critical thinking and literary analysis, but they also connect to SEL. So it allows the readers to think about a decision that a character made. Would you make the same decision? Why did they make that decision? Why would you make a different decision? So we have these also, we have one for Blue Period, Eric, so you can share this as well. So students got to work in groups. We have one for Demon Slayer. So I will, um, yeah, I just wanted to uh, share that as a good way to bring manga into the classroom, focusing on the SEL and having them work with an outside organization for that rigor to learn actually how to create these reading guides that educators and librarians can use from like a fancy level. That's all I wanted to share. <laughs> I, think, I think that's like a great name for that program, you know? like Japanese visual storytelling is like that. That is exactly what it is. There's some, a lot of people do not understand, you know, like the mangaka works in manga. Uh, they have a very different way of thinking than American comic artists. I work with both all the time and the way they come up with things versus the way, you know, the, the state sites artists come up with things is a very different process. And, uh, and I have been bridging the gap, you know, and have both think, you know, a little bit differently with the East meets West culture nowadays, you know, uh, for them to create something that, you know, sometimes would be good for both. Uh, for us, what we have been doing, um, we have been working with people like, you know, Eric here or Matt, you know, Pop Culture Classroom and a lot of other organizations that promote reading literacy uh, literacy with uh, graphic novels and mangas uh we create uh, uh study guides uh teaching guides and then we put it out for free on our website uh mangaclassics.com um and uh our goal is always to hopefully use these as a very attractive medium to get kids to read something that they deemed very boring nowadays, probably. You know, they rather read Harry Potter, they rather read like Hunger Games, they rather read those books. But then I, I do believe that classic literature has its values. Um, a lot of people kind of started dismissing them, thinking that, you know, like this is outdated, you know, the, the concept, the, the ideas, the contents are outdated. But I, I really think that we all have to learn from history, we have we can we cannot dismiss what has been done before, and there are a lot of elements in classic literature that we can learn, uh, you know, on, on a social context, what we have been, you know, back in the days, and how it contrasts, how it is now, uh, what, how is different, and these are things that we can learn, and we keep it very faithful to the original um, author's vision, 
when we're doing the mangas and stuff. So it's we 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 didn't change it. We, uh, you know, like we didn't put zombies into Pride and Prejudice, you know, and stuff like that. And that is a very brilliant con uh, concept, by the way. I'm not dissing that concept, but the goal of my books, uh, you know, um, it's to answer my mom's call of doing something that's more educational. So we we take a different approach. Um, so when we go like, you know, so, so what's, what's, what's your, what's your spin on this? It's like, you know, my spin on this is there's no spin that is as faithful and as pure to the original thing as possible. And I hope that would actually also help engage students on actually learning and understanding, you know, what, what the original, like what Shakespeare original intent to say, or what, you know, um, uh, L.M. Montgomery intended to say in Anne of Green Gables or, you know, um, Count of Monte Cristo, Le Miserable, and all those books that, you know, that sometimes people find it intimidating. Like Le Miserable, a couple thousand pages. You got this big book. Nobody wants to pick it up and read it. No kids would go like, oh my God, I don't want to do it. But you give them a manga. This is Le Miserable. And they found it interesting. And, they, and then they can get the gist of it. They can understand, you know, the, the core values of what, you know, the storytelling is, what the characters want to tell you. And this is what we want to present. Uh, you know, to to the to the kids, and I think you know Eric can can attest because he we work together a lot on creating programs together. I just wanted to share that all the webinars come with a resource list, so we will be putting pop culture classroom reading guides on there. We'll be putting manga classic reading guides on there, so that everybody has access to them. Uh, thank you. Anybody else want to share how they uh, teach manga? Yeah, I want to connect to uh, what folks have been talking about with the uniqueness of the medium and um, just talk a little bit more about the Japanese visual language. So like with your class, um, Japanese visual storytelling, um, the same idea of like, it can also be introduced as like our students are becoming bilingual. You know, they're, they're adopting a visual vocabulary and visual language specific to another culture. And so, um, so, you know, in terms of doing that, they're learning the, the techniques, the stylistic devices, um, but also the grammar. It's a real language um, and with real grammar and systems of structure that can be learned and then imitated and also experimented and played with in really innovative ways. And then students are incorporating those tools into their own little toolkit of ways to communicate themselves um, and blend different languages and media in, in the texts um, and products and artifacts they want to create and share with the world. So, you know, some of those are uh, that are specific to JVL, a Japanese visual language um, that we've kind of touched on already, but um, really promote that empathy building in, in readers more than Western comics maybe do. Like there's been a lot of systematic studies comparing hundreds of titles in Western comics and, and manga that have found, you know, much more significant use in manga of the types of panels and panel transitions that really zoom in on a particular event or moment and um, just give you glimpses of all the different corners or scenes or perspectives on one moment in time. Um, there's lots of different terms for this, but um, uh, Neil Kahn talks about it in terms of macros panels and monos panels and micros panels, where in Western comics, it's much more common that you would have bigger scenes or macros panels, um, more characters involved, more action involved, much more of those to tell a story. Whereas in manga, you see a lot more of the, the minos um, panels where you'll really just get like a picture of a wheel and then a picture of a foot um, and a picture of the nail that was poking the wheel and that was poking the foot. And then a few other panels that are showing that in a different light and a different angle. Um, and so some folks have, have conjectured that, you know, that, that goes along with less of a goal oriented type of storytelling and more of a um, being there is the point, not getting somewhere, um, I think is what Scott McCloud had said once before. Um, but just again, showing that controlling that time and pace that Co had talked about earlier. Um, and just letting letting students really sit with those different perspectives on one moment in time that build, builds that empathy. So yeah, just teaching in terms of the actual Japanese visual language and thinking about it almost as like a language class um, and, and that we're creating these bilingual visual speakers. 
it's going to be really hard for me to not talk for the next hour on this question. So I'll, I'll try to keep it concise here because I do have a ton to say on this idea of, of how to get like what I've done with it in the classroom for. First of all, I just completely agree with you on the way that we establish like setting in a moment in manga. Um, I'm, I completely ate up uh, Vinland Saga, which is, I mean, besides Fullmetal Alchemist, probably one of my favorite a manga that that I've ever read and I mean the the way those scenes are established and the, the moments in the panels are just like unreal the art is unreal and the way that it's done is just fantastic so when I decided to teach a manga book for the first time I didn't know a lot about it and I hadn't read a lot other than like Death Note and a little bit of like Naruto I hadn't read a lot of, of manga so I asked my students I said because they had like what should we read as a class like those of you that have read a lot of manga what should we read? And then they had a really good honest discussion and they were going back and forth like, we should read this. No, there's a little too much like sexualization in this one. How about this? The language is not really appropriate. So they were self-monitoring because they know what's appropriate for a classroom and they landed on Full Metal Alchemist. And, and that was the first time I'd ever read it. So they gave me like two or three titles. It was a Friday. I went and bought them the next day. And then I read them all over the weekend and I was like, Full Metal Alchemist it is. So then I created the lesson guides for that like in real time as I was teaching it. The thing about it though, I think we're, we're, we get hung up a little bit about the resources on teaching manga, but like, it's just a book, right? And, and I'm, I don't mean just a book. I'm not trying to trivialize what it is, but I mean, we talk about tone, setting, mood, you know, symbolism, all of that stuff's exactly the same. Yes, it is different in the way you have to build that, that bridge and help students read backwards right and and i've read i've read so much manga lately and i'm sure the people in this room can relate that i picked up a batman book the other day and i started reading the page backwards and i was like whoa that was the first time that's ever happened probably somebody who's learning a second language and they the first time they think in that second language and they're just like whoa that was strange i had that i had that moment when i picked up a batman book and and read it uh backwards um but i do think that like we need to incorporate our students more especially in this thing that we're teaching that they know more about than we do. So don't be afraid to get them more involved in the process and then just be that facilitator, right? We don't necessarily, when I let them pick, that conversation happened so organically and naturally. I was so impressed with that. And to Eric's point, those manga classic books highly went past my expectations of what they were going to do because a lot of manga is historical like there's a lot of period piece mangas so the students are kind of used to living in that past the art is fantastic in those manga classic books and that helps because those classics illustrated and a lot of the other adaptations the art's not that great and if it's if it doesn't look cool it's not going to be cool. I hate to say that, but it's kind of true when you're dealing with a classroom of students. But that manga classics art is really good. And if that cover and those first pages bring them in, they're in. And when I had all of those books in my classroom, I actually, when I was teaching an English course, I had a lit circle of the manga classics books. And the kids, once they finished the book they chose, they were like, wait, what are the other ones? And they, some of them read all four of the options and I've never had that in a lit circle happen before, right? And the school I teach at now, we have a pretty good selection of the manga classics in our school library. And I'll just see students in my classroom reading them. They just go down and check them out and no teacher is teaching it. They're just checking them out and reading them. And I always engage them in a conversation about those manga classics books and they love them. Like 100% love those books. And it's because those stories are timeless, but it's the art. The art is super good. So any creators out there, like don't minimize the, the power of, of making something look appealing. Uh, so I know I, I said I could talk way too long on that. So I hope I had a couple of good nuggets in there. So I'm going to be quiet so we can move on now, but I hope that helped a little bit. Is it okay for me to respond to this question as well? Okay, yeah. I really liked hearing from one of you guys because you're confirming something that I do when I'm teaching future librarians about how to select manga, which is the idea like, what is the format? What is what is a part manga that makes it Japanese? And how does this differ from other mediums? How does this differ from different graphic narratives? Recently at the UBC High School, I was teaching manga to a class of future librarians who are focusing on youth literature. And I spent a lot of time thinking like, what can I teach them for the super fan? And the person who's like, and I was like, you know what? 
I can teach them language. I can teach them skills so they know how to talk about format and the uniqueness of manga and affect their selection. So I actually have this line next to me because I wanted to remember exactly what I said. So it was Fumio Kono manga about manga's visual language and manga iconography, so Mampu. There's a wonderful section on this in the City Exhibition manga because it's her manga, talking about manga. So I extracted those words. So flow of frames, speech bubbles, special effects, sound effects, and I used an image to show them what this looks like. And then I talk about other things and so forth. But the purpose is that now the students, if they have an interest of manga, are actually doing it as research and going beyond selecting or teaching manga, they can be like, the flow of frames in this page is, it's really good. And I, I just, I, I got a lot of good responses from the students from that lecture because at the end, they asked me hard questions, which is awesome because it means that they're engaged and they're really learning about manga and how they can in the future select it based on the, the format because of how significant it is in teaching. Something you said, Victoria, reminded me when I started my class this semester, the first question I asked was how many people have read manga before? 50% of the kids had never touched it. And I was like, at first I was like, oh no. But then I was like, ooh, this is exciting to now get, you know, six, there's 32 kids in the class, 16 kids on board. So the first couple of lessons, I really had to show them how to read right to left, how to read the speech bubbles, how to read the order of the text, how to read some of the Japanese visual language. And it was so fascinating. Um, and then having like the expert students who have been reading manga since they were young, being able to support these new readers. So thinking about not just just diving into the, the literature, right, the literary analysis, but actually focusing on the visual storytelling pieces that are happening. Anybody else want to share about teaching with manga? Dustin, do you have any ideas? No pressure for your for your new class in the fall that you're like, or books that you're considering or anything? Yeah, so um, your what you did with the uh, the reading guides was something that I was actually considering and having um, QR codes at for each of the uh, on the shelves in the library. So the students could scan those and they could see the reading guides. Uh, but I really like the look of what you got. Um, so I might, I might be stealing that from you. I really liked that. And, and I, after I've already proclaimed my love for Full Metal Alchemist a few times already, uh, that is going to be one of our texts. There we go. Yes. Uh, Co's got it right there. Full Metal Alchemist will be one of our class texts. I generally let students pick everything I do in a class, um, but they are going to be reading that one. Uh, that, that is for certain. Thank Can you. I say a quick thing? Oh, yeah. Oh, just a quick thing about appropriateness, because I know there, 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 there's yes. a question in there. I just want to comment about appropriateness. Um, I know it's hard for librarians to read everything that's on their shelves. I had this conversation with teachers and librarians all the time. And especially we know with a lot of, you know, this past year with a lot of books being in question in school libraries, it's going to be impossible for librarians to read every single book on their shelf. However, I would say that it's not impossible for teachers to read fully read every book that they teach right so just because you hear a book is good or the kids like the book doesn't mean you should just teach it you need to and i say this every time if people have heard me speak before teachers need to read everything they put in front of their students because you don't want to give them oh God, something please you read please teacher. don't <laughs> please don't teach a book without having read it oh that sounds like a no. terrible idea <laughs> but people, what people do people will put will put books in front of students without having read the whole thing right um and and i just want just once again please do that right because my students love dr stone and they recommend dr stone to me all the time and dr stone is a cool interesting series but at the same time like the sexualization of those women characters in that book it's like something that I was like, nah, like I, I, I'm okay with this. Like, I don't, I don't need to kind of, and I have those conversations with my students that let me read it. And I'm like, here's why this is kind of like, not my thing. Right. This is this, this panel right here is like a little ridiculous and they won't disagree with me. Right. But that's something that just saying, especially if you're not used to the medium, some of these titles will have over sexualization in them and you need to be aware of that. So please, please read everything you're putting in front of your students, teachers. I have one sentence more of a tip. Is that okay? Co, can you hold up that FMA for me again, please? That FMA volume you have? That is the newest edition, and it is, to my knowledge, uncut. What that means, if you're teaching manga and you read it a few years ago, you might have read the cut version. 
So read the edition that you're teaching because it might have scenes that have changed, texts that have changed, and it might be problematic or not age appropriate anymore. I rant about that on the Intellectual Freedom blog if you want to know more. I, I, I totally agree, you know, like uh, with manga, that is why it still has this taboo because, you know, like I, I work with a lot of mangaka and Japanese editors and stuff too. And we sometimes when we publish a manga in, in the States, we have to go and censor something because something that is totally completely acceptable in Japan, social context wise, might not be acceptable here. And some of the purest manga fans are all the rage about like, you should not censor anything. You 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 you're, you're you're changing something, but uh, in, in a lot of cases, you know, it's it's a it's an age appropriate thing. It's also like a age sexualizing some like really younger age kids type problems that you know in Japan they don't see that as a, as a, as, as an issue, but here it becomes a bigger social problem. Um, so so yes, you know, there are a lot of books that you need to kind of flip through to check to make sure. Maybe go to online. You know, look, look at, look at reviews, and if you don't know, you know, then maybe talk to someone. But uh, yes, you know, do not just pick up any book. Um, you know, to 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 do our manga classics is like completely, totally clean because it was created as an educational material. You know, so that is one thing. Um, I remember when we we're doing Romeo and Juliet. Remember, Romeo and Juliet went to bed when they were teenagers. Um, and uh, we, the, our artists initially made them kind of naked with a, with you know, with the standard, you know, PG thirteen kind of uh, a movie scene that you know they are in bed, they you know they show their shoulders, but then they show and don't show anything else. And at the end, it was like, nope, uh, this is just too much. You know, they they're it, 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 they, they're supposed to be like 13, 14 years old. It's like no, he, he can't do that. And then we just have them fully clothed as if they just sleep together in bed, but. Didn't, we implied that they didn't do anything. It's just like a, you know, like just like a standard, very puppy love type hugging and stuff. Just cause, you know, just cause, because that's that's how we need to do it here. Um, and uh, we got we got we got a couple of interesting books. Uh, one of the books I want to recommend, uh, you guys check it out is uh, Otherworldly Izakaya Nobu. This is actually a very slice of life, uh, food manga. I love food myself, you know, if you cannot figure out that I named my other company Udon, which is based on Japanese noodles. <laughs> uh, but this this book, uh, it's also a very interesting book that you guys can use to teach different languages because the premise of the book is this izakaya, which is like a Japanese pub. Um, one day, all of a sudden, the front door opens up to kind of like a pseudo ancient German city. So these ancient German people started going into this pub and you know, coming up is like, you know, what, what is, what is, uh, what is uh, this izakaya? What is Japanese food? And they have, they tried more than Japanese food for the first time. So it's kind of like an East meet West type thing. It's like these Western people never try Japanese food before. They come in and eat sushi and eat raw fish and eat fried Japanese fried chicken and eat Japanese, you know, spaghetti and stuff like that. And then through that, they find a bond with the chef they find some bonding with different Patreons and it's a very heartwarming tale that expands the world throughout volumes. But because the place is in German, we actually have all the German people, when they talk about food, we have them use the German term. Uh, and then when the Japanese people talk about food, we have them use the Japanese term. And there are actually other people coming in from different places. There are some French guys coming in to town and then when they talk about their food when they talk about ingredient stuff they they put I, we put the french um term terminology in it so it's kind of like a language uh you know little little food language trivia thing going on in this book and and also this one which would like don't read it at night when you're hungry that's that's what i you know i'm gonna say uh but do check this one out um and as i said and as everybody said full metal alchemist man this is the one that everybody should read. You know, I didn't publish it. Viz, this, Viz <laughs> does a beautiful job on this collected edition. But, uh, you know, as Victoria was saying, I don't know how they changed the text and stuff. So, you know, for educational purposes, you should check out the original edition versus this new one. So thank you, Eric, for leading us into our last question. So at the end of every webinar, we like to give some manga suggestions to the librarians and the educators that are listening. 
And you could do this in any way you want. You can list off some manga that you suggest, or you can book talk a manga. Um, but I, I'm just going to share uh, little lists that I made because I divided manga into three sections, instructional manga, social emotional learning manga, and manga for the artwork. So some instructional manga that can be included in the class or in the library is Cells at Work, focuses on human biology, Laid Back Camp, focuses on camping, Sweetness and Lightning for cooking, Love and Focus for photography, and Heaven's Design Team for physics and animal biology. Uh, for social emotional learning, Comey Can't Communicate focuses on social anxiety. User the Pet Vet uh, for younger readers, it's loss and grief. The Golden Sheep, that just covers like every teen uh, issue you can imagine. A Silent Voice for hearing disability or bullying. Our Dreams at Dusk and Boys Run the Riot for the LGBTQ plus community. Sorry, Victoria. <laughs> and Tokyo Ghoul for identity. And then for manga artwork, these are some of the ones that I find the artwork just absolutely inspiring. The Girl from the Other Side, The Ancient Mangus Bride, Witch Hat Atelier, A Bride Story, Akira, and pretty much anything Junji Ito makes. So those are my suggestions. And if anybody else has book talks or lists they would like to share, please go ahead. I'll go first just because it might make you all laugh. You guys have been stealing the book list I made this whole time, just so you know. So I'm going to read it, but just see this is like a second recommendation because these works are clearly very awesome. So happy pride. I wanted to highlight manga for teacher, for teachers across North America who are designing lessons about LGBTQIA history and social issues due to old, new, and emerging educational standards. So for teachers wanting to discuss queerness and families, as well as the difficulties around coming out, I recommend My Brother's Husband and I Think Our Son is Gay as two series which address this. Um, if we, excuse me. For stories featuring trans and non-binary characters from elementary school through university and beyond, uh, how about you check out the elementary and middle school focus, Wandering Sun, high school, college, life, blue period, or just check it for the art because apparently that's awesome too, and childhood to marriage, the bride was a boy. What about your teaching Japanese to English translation? We have Boys Run the Riot, which is everything we all love, but it's it's localized by an all trans localization team. So that can really tell you like how does identity affect our translation? How can we teach this in the classroom? It's just, it's so good on so many levels for so many different instructions. And our dreams at dusk. So it was written and illustrated by an aromantic asexual extended creator, uh, Kamatani, and it features one of the few depictions of asexuality in English language manga, which is probably why Julie mentioned because there's so little representation. So why don't you also talk about that in the class when you're teaching it, right? Because there's so much to go about. Uh, from this work. And so what if you're like thinking, hmm, we have to go beyond just reading the narrative, we have to do some stories now. Well, what about including By Your Side, the first 100 years of Yuri Anime and Manga by Arthur Fino? It just came out. And she tells you how you're going to read that book. It has essays. And Jillian's grabbing it. You can just pick the essay. You don't have to read the whole book. And then you can like make it as expansive or as fitting for your classroom as you can. And then you're teaching manga history, which is awesome. And then finally, um, I wanted to say that Unfortunately, this stuff is being challenged, but it's okay. We'll figure it out because in the Google Doc that you get with this webinar, I will have um, resources for you guys to face this challenge so you can keep career books in the classroom. Okay, I'm done. Follow that, friends. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> um, I would say I kind of break it down into age groups, right? So I would say um, My Hero Academia is really great for like fifth grade and up, maybe fifth through like seventh, eighth grade, um, especially because it is kind of your classic hero coming, uh, you know, hero origin story. So there's a lot that you can do comparatively, uh, comparing it to Western comic or Western movies, things like that. Um, I think for middle grades and early high school, Comey Can't Communicate is fantastic. Um, it has mostly unproblematic trans representation. It is uh, great for social emotional learning. Um, it's just like a really wholesome story to, to, to read. Um, and the anime is out now as well for that one. Um, and then for older audiences for high school or college, I really like Uzumaki. Um, I think that there's so much to dive into with Uzumaki when you think about themes, when you think about characters, um, when you think about allegory, all those type of things, um, you know, it, that would be great for a film club, uh, sci-fi club to talk about uh, body horror and, you know, where all those inspirations are drawn from. Um, and then for adults only, 
adults only. I definitely recommend uh, Massive. Um, it's a collection of uh, gay erotic mangaka. Um, and so it kind of talks about that element of it and different artists and their styles and where they come from. So again, very adult only, it is extremely graphic, but it has a lot of the backstory of where um, a lot of that style kind of came from. I'm kind of the newbie here when it comes to all, I, I can't wait for the resources of this webinar so I can just dive in and read all of these recommendations. I really, I mean, I read a ton of American comics still too, Western comics. So I can't wait. Uh, I will say though, just for people in, in my, my perspective of people who are just looking to kind of read interesting things that maybe your students would be into that haven't been mentioned so far. Uh, students are loving Spy Family, right? Spy X Family is one that is super popular right now. I know my, a lot of my students, although it's it's very brutal and horror side, um, but they're reading um, Chainsaw Man. And Chainsaw Man is like one that's like, if you just want to get references that your students are making, nobody's mentioned Attack on Titan 2, which, which is just like brilliantly popular. Uh, both the anime and the manga is one that's been, I think it's finished, but it's super popular. Uh, I really like in Kaiju number eight, and I think there's only two books out right now, but that's a really fun title about it's says, I'm not gonna tell you much about it. I ain't got time, but check out Kaiju number eight, only two books in. So you don't have to feel overwhelmed. Once again, I want to give a shout out to Vinland saga, which I just absolutely love. And don't be freaked out when you get to page 1600 and it says end of prologue. Don't be freaked out by that. And then, of course, the manga classics. The, you need to, if we're here in an educational sense and you haven't read those, some of those manga classics yet, you need to go ahead, see what, which ones are out there of your favorite uh, classical titles, pick those up and read those as well. So I'll end my suggestions there. And there's been so many amazing ones already listed. I'll, I'll just name two. I'll go quick. Um, first is... Perfect World, um, and second is Trigon. Uh, that is one of my uh, childhood favorites. It's been out for quite some time since the 90s, uh, but it is a sci-fi Western that is very philosophical. But Trigon, Trigon is awesome too. Trigon gets me you know, in, into this sci-fi Western type thing way before this Cowboy Bebop. Um, and, and then later on, you know, I, I got to become friends with Naito Sensei and Naito Sensei is like a super awesome guy. Uh, you know, he was actually in the last uh, uh, San Diego and we hang out lining up for the Avengers autograph at the Marvel booth. And it was really fun <laughs> with him that way. Uh, but but he's a brilliant artist and, and the way he, he comes up with the Trigon world and everything, the world building and everything is it's so awesome and everybody should check out Trigon. Not because it's done by my friend, but it's actually really good. Yeah, I'll just mention one that I'm reading right now, Oweishin Bow, I think. Um, very popular. Sorry, I think I'm blurred. Um, food comic, I think the translation is the Gourmand um, 100 volumes or so, um, but they've been translated and I'm just really interested right now in food comics in general. I'm reading what a comic cookbook, uh, cook Korean, um, and there's a whole you know genre of them. And so, rounding that out with a manga classic um, on food and storytelling. So um, connecting to Eric's delicious commentary earlier, recommend this one. Yeah, I read I read Oishinbo, you know, as I grow up, and I learned so much about food uh, i mean like like ocean is an intense intense version for people who don't know it's an intense crash course on on food the ingredient the culture and everything each book focus on one just one thing and, and and it's amazing the the amount of research that they go into that the amount of 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 information that go into that you know like compared to nobu that we publish nobu is a very light hearted you know, they, they just talk about day-to-day -day Japanese pub food and stuff. Oishinbo is like an encyclopedia of, you know, those in ingredients. I'm pretty sure the chief that would agree. And I think, you know, for foodies like us, those are the ones, you know, that, that you really want to get into. And then you can probably go and teach like, you know, like a, a cooking, uh, you know, related class 
uh, you know, with, with Oishimbo as a reference book. I think we can all agree that manga is amazing and every teacher should spend their summer thinking about how they're going to teach manga in their curriculum in some capacity, right? That's That was the goal of our webinar. <laughs> but uh, we're going to close out. So thank you to Manga Classics, Pop Culture Classroom, and all of the experts for participating in this discussion about teaching with manga. If you would like to view any of the previous Manga and Libraries webinars, you can, of course, visit mangaandlibraries.com. Unfortunately, Manga and Libraries will be taking a break over the summer. Well, maybe not, unfortunately. But uh, exciting news is just around the corner. So have a wonderful summer, and we'll see you back in September. Take care. <laughs>